grab some champagne, and relax with a few cigars, because we have David Fincher's latest biopic about the man who wrote one of the most critically acclaimed films of all time, Citizen Kane. In this video we'll be going over how writer Herman J. Mankiewicz made this American classic, his relationship with Orson Welles, and how newspaper tycoon William Randolph Hearst, also known as Tywin Lannister, tried to bury the picture from ever being distributed. But before we get into all these cool details, make sure to like and subscribe, because here we go. As the beginning of Mank states, Citizen Kane would never have been made if it weren't for an ambitious young storyteller named Orson Welles, who at the time was a huge name in radio. You might remember him as the guy who voiced and directed the War of the Worlds radio broadcast which was so realistic it caused widespread panic when people thought aliens were actually invading. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. Believe it or not, Citizen Kane was the third movie Wells pitched to RKO after his first two ideas were rejected. He enlisted the help of Mank, who at the time had been writing some radio plays for him. Wells himself had been busy doing test screening for an adaptation of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, which was to be his first film, shot entirely in long shots and told from a first person perspective. But the venture was deemed too costly and was dropped, paving the way for Citizen Kane. Mank did end up getting in a car crash with fellow screenwriter Tommy Phillips, breaking his leg in three places. But it wouldn't be until three months later that he'd start writing Citizen Kane. In order to understand how that movie came to be, we have to understand the man behind it, as many aspects of Herman Mankiewicz's personal life bleed into the script. Although we're with Mank for only two hours during the course of this film, we certainly do get an impression of who he was. You cannot capture a man's entire life in two hours. All you can hope is to leave the impression of one. The same is true of Charles Foster Kane, the fictitious newspaper tycoon based off real-life media magnate William Randolph Hearst, whom Mank had been a part of his inner circle. He became involved with Hearst through Charles Letterer, a child prodigy who went to college at the age of 13 and whom Mank invited to Hollywood to make it big in the pictures. At the time, movies were transitioning out of the silent era, and now films needed right more than ever. Little did Mank know that his relationship with Hearst and his mistress Marion Davies would become the basis for his greatest work yet. The question is, why would Mank throw his friends under the bus and write a movie that portrays them as sad, pathetic creatures? And this is what the film Mank tries to get at. First, we see how Mank is trying to create something that lasts, a work that will stand out as his masterpiece. As he drunkenly tells his wife one night, For the last time, what? What year is it? Herman. I should have done something by now. This is perhaps why he so vehemently fights for his writing credit at the end of the film, an argument with Orson Welles that results in Welles smashing the place up and inspiring this iconic scene from Citizen Kane. <laughs> At the time, Mank was out of work, having burned bridges with people like Louis B. Mayer, the studio head of MGM, so he agreed with Orson not to take a writing credit. In the film's climax, Mank fights for this credit, even willing to be sued and lose his money on the project just for the chance that his name will appear on it. He knows this is his best work, and he wants to fight for what is right. Some have argued that Mank's script is an attack on Hearst for having been ousted out of his inner circle. Hearst took a liking to Mank early on, often inviting him to his lavish estate named San Simeon, which would become the inspiration for Charles Kane's Xanadu. In the film, this falling out with Hearst ends with Mank outlining the plot to Citizen Kane, masked as a modern day retelling of Don Quixote, with Hearst playing the part of the titular hero himself. He ends up making such a fool of himself he pukes, and a fool he thinks he is. He's referred to as a court jester more than twice in the film, and he asks his wife four times in the movie why she's still with him, even though he thinks he's a lousy drunk. He even calls her poor Sarah for for being married to him. This outburst was a long time in the making. He had gotten to know Hearst personally and seen how his power had manipulated the population. This is never more evident than in the election between Democratic Socialist Upton Sinclair and Republican Frank Merriam. Off the heels of the Great Depression, the established elite feared Sinclair, who ran on a campaign of ending poverty and making the rich pay their fair share. So they used fear tactics and manipulation via the media to influence voters. Mank talks to his wife about how he knows one of the voices 
voice actors portraying an anti-Sinclair widow on the radio was actually an actress, or how his director friend Shelley Metcalf was hired to create anti-Sinclair propaganda, which saw a fake Russian saying how he's gonna vote for Comrade Sinclair, and fake footage of homeless people coming off the trains in droves. Shelley would later go on to kill himself, blaming himself for being part of Sinclair's loss. Mank even tries to get Marion Davies to go back to Irving Thalberg, then head of production at MGM, to pull the ads, but she refuses, saying she's already made her grand exit, something Mank can't help but laugh at the absurdity of. <laughs> One can't help but notice the symbolism of Marion being traded to another studio, a commodity like one of the sets paraded out with her. Bonus points if you saw that Sinclair here is played by Bill Nye the Science Guy. For Mank, people like Hearst and Louis Mayer are without ideals. They have no moral compass. It's perhaps studio head Louis Mayer who best personifies this. He cuts his workers' pay in half while he keeps his huge salary, even swaying his workers to cheer for him after cutting their wages. For him, it's all an act. How'd I do, man? He even fakes crying at Irving Thalberg's funeral, throwing his handkerchief out the window after knowing he no longer needs it in public. It's Hearst, however, who Mank has more disdain for, because unlike Mayer, Hearst once held progressive ideals. He believed in helping the poor and a more fair distribution of wealth. Now, however, he's turned his back on those ideals in favor of greed and personal gain, just like how Charles Foster Kane does. In Citizen Kane, Kane is depicted as an idealist, even printing on the front page of his first paper, a declaration of principles, stating that his paper will have no special interest and that he will champion the rights of its readers as human beings. By the end of the film, Kane's best friend mails him back this declaration, which Kane promptly rips apart. Hearst, too, has turned away from his ideals. In the end, however, Mank's outburst at the party was not out of anger, but out of sorrow. What I said was more in sorrow than in anger, really. He knows how Hearst grew up unloved. The thing you got so right in your script was how lonely he'd been as a boy. That's why Hearst ran for political office, to get that feeling of being loved. In Citizen Kane, Kane too runs for office, wanting the love of the people, something he never got from his parents as a child. In fact, in Citizen Kane, his real parents essentially sign him away. Don't you think I'd better meet the boy? I've got his trunk all packed. I've had it packed for a week now. Speaking of Citizen Kane is Kane's mistress, Susan Alexander, who will later become his second wife. She's based off Marion Davies, a film star and her real life mistress depicted in the film by Amanda Seyfried. In Citizen Kane, she's depicted as a terrible opera star who Kane uses his power and pull in the media to give her good reviews and headline shows. The same is said of Marion and Hearst in real life, using his power and connections with studio heads to get Marion lead roles. We see that Mank and Marion have a warm platonic relationship. He knows that she's not happy in this relationship, even catching her outside drinking booze she's kept hidden. In real life, like in Citizen Kane, Marion would become increasingly isolated at San Simeon, turning to alcoholism and lamenting her loneliness. Mank asks her nephew Charles to give her a copy of his script, knowing full well that the opera singer in his story is based off Marion. Perhaps if Marion read the script, she'll see what her life has become. But it's Charles that warns Mank whether this cure he's proposed is better than the disease itself. And Mank is warned not to go through with the movie by three of his close friends. Going up against William Randolph Hearst is no walk in the park. Charles doesn't want him to go through the picture as he sees it as a betrayal to his aunt. Are you hoping I might absolve you of such a personal betrayal? His brother Joe warns him that if he goes through with it, he'll likely never work again. You pick a fight with Willie. You are finished. Mayor can't save you. Nobody can. And Marion doesn't want him to do it because how it will make Hearst look. Mank doesn't give in. Unlike the other characters we see in the movie, he has ideals. He has principles. He's fighting for something, and in this way, he's almost like that young Charles Foster Kane. During the dinner scene, Mank talks about how his main character will look into the mirror and see his younger self, a reminder of the idealistic young person he turned his back on. He smashes it in anger, the final metaphorical blow to his youth, much like how in Citizen and Kane, the smashing of the snow globe represents the death of Kane's youth, the time where he was most happy. It's actually the death of two things, his life and of his idealism. Destroying in the process not one man, but two. 
It's no wonder that the guests at Hearst's mansion are dressed up in circus attire. Their lives are a circus, wild, hilarious, sad, and often out of control. Mank is escorted off Hearst's property by the man himself, but not before being told the parable of the organ grinder's monkey, a story of how a monkey who thinks himself in control is forced to perform for his street peddler owner every day. In this parable, Mank is the monkey and Hearst is the owner. It's a story often used to describe the act of one who does the bidding for someone much more powerful. Mank even refers to himself as Hearst's organ grinder monkey when talking to Houseman. Are you familiar with the parable of the organ grinder's monkey. Mank himself is a deeply flawed character, an alcoholic and chronic gambler, but that's not to say flawed characters can't be good people. Rita finds that he sponsored hundreds of German refugees, his parents having been immigrants from Germany themselves. He's a man of principle, even though alcoholism consumed him, a disease which would ultimately take his life at the age of 55. When Citizen Kane was ultimately released in 1941, it was a box office flop, largely due to a giant campaign by William Randolph Hearst who didn't allow any advertisement for the film in his papers, and who also threatened theaters who showed it with libel. It was, however, nominated for all nine categories the Oscars had in 1942, winning Best Original Screenplay. Wells and Mank would not go on to collaborate after their success, and at the end of the film, Mank is asked why Wells got a credit for the film in the first place. Mank says it's because of, quote, Hollywood magic, but Orson claims he wrote his own draft, then combined it with Mankiewicz's to create somewhat of a hybrid. He's quoted as saying, I used what I wanted of Manx and, rightly or wrongly, kept what I liked of my own. So I leave it up to you to decide whether or not he should have received a credit. Overall, Manx isn't just a story about the making of Citizen Kane, it's the story of how a story comes to be, how real life can influence what we tell and why we want to tell it. But I want to hear what you thought of the movie below. Thanks for watching everyone, while you're here, why not like and subscribe, and for more bad takes you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, Daddy loves you very much much.